This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Uh-oh. Believe it or not, there were only a couple of bloopers during this build. Sorry about that. Uh, first step was to mill and plane flat all of the lumber for this project, which, by the way, if you didn't read the title, is a walnut console table. So I needed to mill up some eight quarter, some four quarter. I did that, and then I stacked and stickered it, let it sit for a week almost and acclimate. And during our review of the plans, Lola just completely lost interest. So once the wood was nicely acclimated to my environment, I milled it down to final dimension, the legs to two inches, and the remainder to three quarters of an inch. Now the first step was to make a template for the legs, and since they splay out at five degrees, I took a scrap piece of plywood and cut each end at that five degrees. Now I start my taper two inches down from the top, and then it's two inches wide, tapering down to one and a quarter inch at the bottom. I use my setup blocks to avoid any mismeasurements, and then I use a long straight edge to connect those points. And head over to the table saw where my tapering jig was anxiously awaiting. Now I made this jig a long time ago. It's a direct replica of the Rockla version. I just found it easier to make my own because I had the jig parts laying around. Okay, before we make any cuts, let's talk about grain selection for our legs. She got legs. Okay. Here we have what's called quarter sawn, where the grain runs vertical from face to face which produces a nice straight grain on those faces, but on the adjacent sides, eh, not so much. Now on this piece, which is actually flat sawn because it's sawn flat across the grain, what we have hidden in here is what's called rift sawn, where the grain runs at an angle, preferably 45 from face to face. So if we were to rip this here and here, what we have is two rift sawn pieces where the grain is hitting two adjacent surfaces on each growth ring. And what that produces is a nice straight grain on this side, a nice straight grain on the opposite side, and also on the adjacent sides. Here's another good example of that, where the grain is running at roughly a 45 degree angle, and what we have is nice straight grain on all four surfaces. All right, enough chatter. Let's cut some legs. So I'm ripping these a little bit wider than I need because they're going to be tapered on the table saw anyway. Oh, hey, Jerry, welcome aboard. Then I use my template that I made to find the best appealing grain match and try to eliminate any imperfections in the wood where I can. And as we did to our template, I'm cutting the top and the bottom of each leg to five degrees. Set up a nice little stop block there. Make sure they're all consistent. Then give a quick test just to make sure they're all cut to the right angle. And I think we're good. Now, should I taper these first or kind of do all my joinery and then taper later? After much consternation and a refreshing Lime LaCroix, I decided to taper them later. That way I always have two square parallel reference surfaces on my legs when doing the joinery. And speaking of joinery, let's cut some angled bridle joints. Now I am using a tenoning jig here on the table saw. Now if you don't have a tenoning jig, you can easily make your own. I'm going to put a link above to my friend Tamar over at 3x3 Custom who makes one and she has a tutorial on her website on how to build it. Now once I establish the inner and outer cheek of the female part of the bridle, I chew away the waist, and then, as you can see, I still have some tear out, even with the tape there, but no worries, the other half of the bridle joint will cover that. Oh, and it looks like we're moving right on to the other part of that bridle joint. So here are the long stretchers, front and back. These are 3 quarter inch and they are 46 inches long. So I'm raising my table saw blade to 1 eighth of an inch, and as you can see, I'm just using my little Jessam guide there as a stop block. But the kicker here is my miter gauge is set to five degrees because the angled legs are gonna slide into this here. So once I do one side, I'll kind of chew away that waist and I can't just flip this over and do the other cause I'm gonna have to turn that miter gauge five degrees the other way. So after a test fit, ah, just making a little shave on that. Oh, and that fits nice. So now I can finish up the other end And then, as I mentioned, turn the miter gauge five degrees in the other direction and do the same thing over again. And there you have it. Now I did leave the depth on these a little shallow on the table saw because I knew I was gonna come back here and smooth these out with the router point. I love using this tool for fine tuning these joints. Quick little test fit, and that's nice. It slides in with a little bit of effort and comes apart the same. 
Now we can remove the waste on the table saw in this area so that this joint slides together nicely. This will also cover the tear out on the legs that we experienced a little while back when we were cutting those on the table saw. Now remember, since this angled bridle joint is at five degrees, I didn't want to angle my table saw blade to five degrees to match it. So I just went in there with a nice sharp chisel and cleaned that shoulder up. And a quick dry assembly here confirms that we're on the right track. And now it was time to cut our legs. I loaded this bad boy up in the tapering jig. And to be honest, this is always a little bit scary because we've done some joinery. We don't have any other spare parts. So it is with a little bit of trepidation we make these cuts. But they all came out nice and consistent, which is what's great when working with a well-built and accurate jig like this. Then I just cleaned up those saw marks with a card scraper. This could also be done with a bench plane of your choice. Now I can lay out for the end detail on these front and rear stretchers. It starts a quarter of an inch in from the bridle joint and tapers up to three quarters of an inch from the top edge. I head over to the bandsaw to make this cut, it just seemed like the easiest thing to do. And then I could grab a block plane to remove all those saw marks. A lot of saw marks, apparently. Nice and smooth. Now for this first glue up, I'm using old brown glue, which is basically hide glue with a little bit urea in it that extends the open time. Now I decided to use this glue because it's not water-based and won't swell these joints. I already had a nice snug fit on these and I was afraid that putting any PVA glue on it would swell it and then I may have a difficulty putting it together. Now this glue does need to be warmed before using it to make it less viscous, so I just put it in a pot of water on the stove, get it nice and loosey-goosey. Then I could clamp these up. And while those are in the clamps, let's take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people, just like you and me. You can explore new skills like learning how to sing. Stop singing off key in the shower and learn how to tune those vocal cords and blow your friends away at your next karaoke party. Or deepen existing passions like your love of photography, where you can find beginner, intermediate, or advanced classes tailored to your interests and camera gear. Now for me, I shoot everything on my iPhone and then edit the footage in Final Cut Pro on my Mac. Now learning a video editing software on your own like Final Cut Pro can be intimidating, and that's when I came across this amazing class called Video Editing with Final Cut Pro, beginner to YouTuber, taught by Ali Abdal. I discovered a ton of keyboard shortcuts to speed up my editing and color grading techniques to help all my footage look consistent throughout my videos. Yeah, that's right. I record my voiceovers in the closet. All right, let's talk turkey here. Now, Skillshare is prepared to offer the first 1,000 of my subscribers who click on the link in the description below a free trial of their premium membership, which lets you explore all the classes that are available. And then it's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription after that. Whoa! And back to the action. Now, once my leg assemblies were dry, I could lay out for my mortise and tenon joints. Now, for the mortises on these, I'm going to use a drill press with a Forstner bit to hollow out the majority of the material. And then I can come back with a chisel to clean up the waste. You can see I'm using a paring block here, which helps keep my chisel vertical when cleaning those walls. And I could tidy up the ends with my mortising chisel. And just a note, ideally you want to cut your mortises first and then cut your tenons to fit. Now I'm using a half inch setup block here just to confirm everything is nice and square. And then I head to the table saw where I can work on the tenons. Now I'm using my table saw sled and a stop block here. The stop block establishes my shoulder. And then I'm using this technique where you drag the piece across the blade back and forth to remove the rest of the waist. Now this is a perfectly safe method, but I also understand that a lot of people may not feel comfortable with this. So if you don't, no big deal. You can just make repeated passes back and forth across the blade as we did with the bridle joint. So I do the same thing on the top and the bottom of the tenon. And there you have it, a pair of twins. Wait, no, no, twins denotes pair, so twins. And router plane for the wind to clean up any saw marks. Now I could move on to these top little stretcher supports. I cut them to length on the table saw. Now I'm using the domino on these for speed and efficiency. I showed you how I did the mortise and tenon earlier, so now it's time to hit the gas and get these done. And at the same time, I can work on these stretchers that will support the bottom shelf. So same process, domino into the end grain, and then also into the leg. And then the ever satisfying dry fit to make sure everything is coming together. And yeah, nothing looks out of whack. Here's a little shooka shooka for Lola. 
Now, since the face of these stretchers are parallel with the outside of the leg, which is five degrees, the top and bottom edges need to be cut to that five degrees so that the shelf sits flat on it, like so. Now, to measure for the long stretcher, which connects the two outer stretchers, I'm using relative dimensioning. So I'm basically taking my workpiece, putting it up there, marking it, cutting it, and then also firing up the domino again to cut those mortises. And while I do another quick dry fit to make sure all parts harmonize, I wanted to mention if you're interested in building a walnut console table of your own, plans are available in the description below. One change you'll notice if you purchase a plans is there's only one middle stretcher on the top instead of two. I decided after that it just wasn't necessary to have that additional one. Now this here is what you call a design on the fly change. I decided to add some decorative little brackets to hold up that bottom shelf across the bottom stretcher. A quick test fit reveals we're good to go. And these blocks are one inch by three quarter by five inches long. I do a pilot hole just to secure my position and then head to the bandsaw. Just create a nice little bevel across the bottom there. Then I can glue these in place. And now I have integral mounting brackets to secure the bottom shelf. Oh, remember that design on the fly thing I mentioned earlier? Yeah, same thing here. I decided after I had assembled this that I wanted to put a one eighth of an inch round over on all my parts just to soften those edges. So with the router, I did that, but I couldn't quite get into certain areas. So with a chisel and some sandpaper, I was able to finish that profile. And then I just started sanding. All these little stretchers needed to be surface prepped before glue up. And I was able to use my noggin here and round over these parts before glue up save myself the heartache and trouble later. All right, we get the idea. And the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, wait, only six. All right, so I didn't show me gluing up this bottom shelf because I mean, seriously, how many glue ups do you need to see? Well, I mean, how much sanding do you need to see? But anyway, glued up, sanded, and now I'm putting a little chamfer profile on each end. I make multiple passes with the router, and I also have a sacrificial block clamped onto the end to prevent any tear out. And then it's more sanding with this thing called the prepping weapon. The shelf mounting holes on the two end stretchers is a two-step process using a Forstner bit and then a regular size bit to create a stepped hole, and this is also enlarged to allow for wood movement. Now I like to work in sub-assemblies when I can because it makes the final glue up less stressful. And you really only need to put this in the clamps for like an hour to make sure that's pretty secure and then you can move on to clamping everything else. You can see I had to put some five degree clamping blocks in there to make sure I had even pressure across the joint. And then it was time to turn on the afterburners and glue up everything. I wanted to quickly mention for those of you that don't know, as of January 1st, building furniture and creating content for YouTube and other social media platforms is now my full time job. So if you're interested in supporting me to help keep the cameras rolling and bringing you as much content as I can, I've started a Patreon account where you can toss something in the tip jar if you're so inclined. And honestly, folks, there's no pressure at all. So thanks for listening. And more importantly, thanks for watching. The next day I could pull this out of the clamps. I did all my necessary surface prep, including glue squeeze out and sanding, and then it was time to apply the Rubio Monocoat. I'm using their color Pure with just a drop of black in it, which helps to mute down that amber tone just a little bit, I think. So I apply it with a white Scotch-Brite pad, rubbing the oil on every surface, and then after 10 or 15 minutes, I wipe off all the excess with a microfiber cloth, making sure there are no drips, and that all surfaces are dry to the touch. And then I put it on the drying rack. Enjoy a celebratory LaCroix. Now, since the top of this table is actually one and a quarter inch thick marble supplied by the client, things get a little squirrely on how to attach it. I don't like drilling into marble or any stone just in case I ruin it or just in case they want to use it for another application down the road. So I'm making these little stop blocks that I can adhere to the bottom of the marble using masking tape and CA glue which will be a very strong connection, but also easily removable without damaging anything. And how about some integrated floor levelers? I'm using standard issue floor levelers from Home Depot. They are one inch wide. I like to recess them in the bottom leg just to make them a little less obtrusive. So once I drill my holes, make sure I cover that with Rubio to seal everything. And then I don't use the supplied insert it comes with because it's plastic. So I put in my own quarter 20 inserts. And there you have it. Now I could attach the shelf and get this thing ready for delivery. 
I left a sixteenth of an inch gap between the shelf and the legs to allow for wood movement. Now this bottom shelf, if you remember, is two pieces of one by glued together. So I'm putting a screw in on each side and that will be my anchor point which will allow expansion and contraction outward from there because the holes are my end stretchers that go up into the shelf have elongated holes. Okay, now we're on site and installing those little lock blocks. Like I mentioned, I'm using some CA glue and green tape to secure them to the marble. Then I can just cut away that excess tape. Then we could stand her up, slide it into place, and drop that marble on top, lock it in. And there you have it, a modern walnut console table with a marble top. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell to be alerted of any of my future projects. And maybe go check out the other two videos in this walnut and marble series, which I will put at the end of this video. And until next time, have fun in the shop and keep building.